Okay, so you should see an acknowledgement that recording is happening and you click got it. Um, here's our agenda for today. We're going to be moving kind of quickly because we're trying to put a whole bunch of stuff into here. Um, so next slide, please. And continue on. Um, briefly, my name is Natalie Bailey and I lead USAID's Wild Meat Learning Group. Um, I'm based in our DDI Bureau in the Biodiversity Division, which is in our Environment Center. And I've worked on wild meat issues for quite a while. I'm a former staff member of the Bush Meat Crisis Task Force, which some of y'all may have heard of. Um, that project ended more than a decade ago, um, but it's it it was around. It was one of the first ways that a whole bunch of people came together to to work on these issues. This learning series, we are very happy to work together with colleagues from USAID's CARPE mission in Central Africa, as well as our colleagues at Fish and Wildlife Service and at the Center for International Forestry Research. And in this webinar series, we really want to bring people together to share lessons learned about wild meat programming, talk about the challenges that we face, strengthen our collaboration, and make everybody aware of resources that exist, resources that are coming, and resources and data needs that we really need. Next slide, please. So these four webinars are listed here. You're gonna get a teaser for each of the three to follow. And all of this is leading up to an in-person wild meat learning exchange that will be held in Central Africa this fall. Uh, the dates are still TBD, but we are really looking forward to this. And our colleagues at the Carpe Mission are gonna be helping to uh, lead the organization and charge on this. Next slide, please. Yes, this is a blank slide because we're gonna fill it in with a fun animation. Um, many of you are likely um, familiar with the conservation standards. We built our USAID Wild Meat Collaborative Learning Group Theory of Change using the conservation standards. We brought together people working on the biodiversity and conservation aspects of this with colleagues working on food security, colleagues working on global health issues, human health issues, as well as practitioners in the field to bring this together. This is a generalized high level theory of change. So not everything that's in here is gonna to apply to every situation. And of course, each situation is gonna have its own, um, its own details and specifics. Um, so we're gonna move through this, starting with our targets. Of course, conservation of wildlife species that are targeted for illegal and or commercial and or unsustainable trade in wildlife for food, that is a primary target. With USAID as a development agency, we also have targets for human well being outcomes, and that includes food security, health, income. To get to this, we need to reduce the threat. What's the threat? The threat is unsustainable and illegal hunting. Um, that can be for international trade, that can be for urban commercial trade, and that can also be for unsustainable subsistence consumption, which also has other factors that feed into that. So we have four key results that can help lead us to that uh, threat reduction result. So we're gonna walk through those one by one. First is addressing consumer preferences and desires for wild meat. So the blue squares are the key results and the yellow hexagons are the, um, are the approaches that we need to take to get to that key result. So behavior change campaigns are a, an important part of reducing consumer preferences. But what about um, demand from rural people? So that's our next piece here is the consumer need for wild meat. So there is a need out there. There's an economic need and there's a, a nutritional need. Well, does it have to be wild meat that supplies that? Not necessarily. So strategic approaches related to increasing alternatives for, econ for um, income as well as um, food and nutrition are strategic approaches there. In some places and in some situations, um, there is a legal urban wild meat commodity chain um, in markets in um, in many countries in Asia. There is a you know it is legal to sell wildlife in markets. Maybe not wildlife from protected species or protected areas, 
um, but it does happen. So how do we tease apart um, what is legal, what is not legal? And this is where we get into regulations, policy, um, and, and legal frameworks, as well as strengthening law enforcement and monitoring. Um, and then the final key result here um, is ensuring that rural sustainable access, rural sustainable subsistence access is maintained. And if local people are going to be able to protect their own resources, they need to be able to have tenure, they need to be able to um, keep other people out. And um, so this is where our, our theory of change all comes together. Uh, and Katie has just shared in the chat um, the full theory of or the link to our full theory of change. So you can you can check that out as well as our evidence collection. Um, next, we have developed a series of learning questions that are linked to these key results. And this is where we test our assumptions. And this is where, you know, our learning group is really working to collect information. Um, so if we could proceed through these slides. So to test assumptions about um, reducing consumer preferences and desires for wild meat, we have questions about the barriers and incentives that motivate that can that demand, uh, the behavior change approaches that are most effective in overcoming those barriers and challenges related to consumer needs for wild meat. Our questions, our, our question is about the effectiveness of alternative protein substitution, particularly for that subsistence level consumption of wild meat. What are the other sources that are out there? How effective are those, are those alternatives? Around the, the wild meat value chain, um, we have questions about the effectiveness of monitoring and enforcing of legal trade, as well as uh, a question about the effectiveness of regulations at reducing the illegal and unsustainable sale of wildlife. Next, um, we've identified a question about the most effective management systems um, that can help support sustainable subsistence consumption for local communities that don't have alternatives without contributing to the commercial hunting. So this is a really tricky one, and I'm, I'm glad we're going to have a, a webinar addressing this in the future. Then we have two questions that are at a broader level. So our question number five is the synergies between wild meat and those focused on zoonotic disease and food security and household income in USAID programming, um, as well as the combination of strategic approaches that will help us to reduce unsustainable and illegal hunting. And for all of this, we also have an under what conditions um, addendum to the question. So all of these together on the next slide, you'll see them all mapped out. Um, and then on the next slide, we've mapped our case studies that the learning group is working on the former and upcoming webinars, and we've mapped all of those onto our theory of change. So the bold with little icons here, that's where, um, that's where you can see our upcoming webinars that are part of this series. And for question six, we're really leading up to our in-person event. You know, what is that combination of strategic approaches that we need to be able to make a difference on these issues? Next slide, please. So for each of our organizations, we're giving you a very, very brief um, overview into, okay, well, how does, how does this particular organization fit in? So on the next slide, you'll see um, how USAID, sorry, next one, how USAID's work maps onto this theory of change. Well, we helped to develop it. So really the theory of change describes many things that we do, um, but really some of this is in fact aspirational. Most of the funding that USAID has for um, programming on the ground comes from biodiversity funds and it's a congressional directive. There are certain things that we can spend that money on and certain things that we can't. So we're working to expand the, um, the types of funding that are working on these issues um, combating wildlife trafficking funding, that's there. That is, a, that is a really key piece of USAID's part of the puzzle. Global health does contribute, um, given that they're concerned about zoonotic disease spillover, and you'll hear a bit more about one of those activities in the future. Um, and really, there's a, there's a great need for food security and agriculture to play a role in this. Um, so we're working towards increased collaboration across sectors, but we're still working on it. We're not there yet. 
Next slide, please. These are some of the key strategic approaches that USAID uses, strengthening protected area management, improving legal and policy frameworks, behavior change campaigns, and promoting alternatives. Um, so you'll see, here's where you kind of see we've got all of these potential strategic approaches, but the ones that we're able to really dig in on are fewer. Next slide, please. We do have a few key projects that we wanted to share. Um, these are, uh, I mapped these out to some of those key results in here. And um, we will, um, yes, we will share links by email afterwards for those who are registered. We'll have all your information and we can, we can send those out. Um, so there are a couple of projects that are mapped to our consumer preferences and behaviors, some that are mapped to consumer needs for wild meat, regulating the urban wild meat commodity chain, and the big one, conservation of wildlife species improved and human well-being improved. I'm not going to get into details in any of these um, because, number one, I'm running out of time, um, but number two, these are all um, case studies that we're developing through the Wild Meat Learning Group. And you can see a screenshot of a not yet finalized um, case study for the Cambodia project, the USAID Cambodia Green Future, where they're taking a behavior change approach to um, helping reduce unsustainable demand for wildlife and other activities. Um, so stay tuned for those. Those will be rolling out. These are some of the, the result. These are, excuse me, these are some of the resources that we want to put in everybody's hands so that we're able to share lessons that have been learned from each of these activities that are coming out. Next slide. Some of the key evidence and data needs, this is a common theme that you'll see from Fish and Wildlife Service and from C4 later on as well. Um, key resources that we currently have are from our evidence collection that's on our website. And uh, Katie already shared the link for that. We can share that again. And for those who are working on cross-sectoral um, approaches to wild meat or other issues that do affect biodiversity as well as affecting other sectors, we have a very, very helpful monitoring, evaluation, research, and learning toolkit that has been developed under our HEARTH activity. So HEARTH is a set of um, partnerships with the private sector for people and the planet. These all have biodiversity and human well-being outcomes. And this toolkit provides a set of resources to help identify what do I need to measure? How do I measure that? And how does this link up with other sectors? So we want to make sure that everybody has access to that. Um, and then we also wanted to share some of the needs that, that we have as USAID. And in particular, a key need is additional data and evidence on the linkages between wild meat consumption and the nutritional and health outcomes, particularly in biodiverse areas. Um, it's harder to tease apart for the, the urban areas. And a lot of the data that USAID collects regarding um, nutritional and health outcomes those come from cities. So that's where the that's where the issue is, is we need we need to be able to better link that in part because we strongly suspect that urban demand is impacting, harming rural communities that need access to it. And uh, additional data can show us what does that access mean for rural people and what happens when they don't have it. Um, so as a development agency, these are some of the questions we're interested in. Next slide, please. To tease up our uh, future webinar in July, I'm going to be with some USAID colleagues. I'm going to be leading a webinar on wild meat and One Health, where we're looking at these synergies between different sectors um, and how we can work together to, for greater impact overall. That's the end of my time. And fortunately, that's the end of my slides. So I'm going to turn it over now to Lisa Corti from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who will talk a bit about the work that they do and how it jives with everything we've been talking about so far. Take it away, Lisa. All right. Thank you, Natalie. Um, we can go on to our next slide. My name is Lisa Corti, and I am a program officer with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I just started with the service in August, um, and today I'm representing 
um, our Africa branch, our team that includes our team lead, Amy Kopevner, Nancy Gelman, Ken Cameron, Matt Louisa, and Olivia Anton. So, um, and as well as our partners who are working in the field. Um, just briefly, I'm a wildlife biologist and prior to coming to Fish and Wildlife Service, I worked as the sanctuary director at Audubon's Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary. I worked with US Forest Service and USAID in Monrovia. I spent six years in Gabon with the Smithsonian Institution in the Gabon Biodiversity Program and spent two years with the Office of Central African Affairs at the State Department. And I look forward to bringing that experience to this topic today. All right, next slide. In regard to our US Fish and Wildlife Service organizational priorities, um, we're really focused on conservation of wildlife species being improved, that green target. And then in terms of our priorities, we're focused on conservation of protected areas, eliminating protected species in trade, as well as strengthening decision-making and management, and then looking at how are these interventions working? How do we monitor and evaluate that? And so in terms of the, um, the, the blue boxes, our projects are looking at consumer preference and desires for wild meat, urban wild meat commodity chain regulated and access to um, first uh, subsistence consumption. And then we'll take a look at the next slide, which shows the strategic approaches. And so in terms of strategic approaches, I'll be sharing with you some of the projects that look at targeted behavior change campaign, looking at enhancing regulations for urban areas, improving and harmonizing legal policy work. You might have laws, but how are they being enforced? And then most importantly, really strengthening protected area management. Where do we have wildlife strongholds that are the sources of wildlife? Next slide. All right, in, in regard to a few of our key projects, um, decreasing threats to protected wildlife populations in Central Africa by reducing demand for bushmeat in large urban areas. This is a project with the Wildlife Conservation Society and really is looking at, um, Natalie had mentioned how urban areas have um, a high demand, a lot of bushmeat that is being consumed that's in the markets. And so how do we know um, what is driving that? And how do we um, be sure that that is not um, having a negative impact on populations in protected areas? Um, so this project is really working at that urban demand, looking at what is what the demand is and changing it with some really um, innovative things such as having a, a local chef in Kinshasa really promoting recipes for meat that is not bush meat, that is not protected species. All right. Another one of our projects in the next slide um, is furthering changing consumer preferences and reducing availability of illegal bush meat in a uh, wetland area of Gabon. This is a local organization that really works at the community level. Um, and one of the things that I'll share is just a couple weeks ago, we received a video from um, one of the, the members of this team that was a video of a pangolin, which is a protected species in Gabon that had been purchased by a uh, head of the household. However, the children convinced the father that this was a protected species and they shouldn't be eating it. And so they came to an agreement to release it. So really working with, um, working with communities to understand, well, what's the legal, what are the legal meat, what's illegal, and getting that message out. All right, another project that we have in the next slide. Um, this is a long-term project that's been in Equatorial Guinea on the island of Bioko. And again, reducing bushmeat supply and demand by increasing wildlife security. So protecting those species that are protected under the law, working to better understand what's the demand, what's being sold in markets. Are we have, seeing new markets pop up? What are those secondary markets? So really looking at um, what's that relationship between the demand, what's in those markets, and how can the species be protected that are protected under the law. Next slide. 
One of our other key projects is combating bushmeat trafficking of protected species in the Congo Basin. And this was an effort to mobilize the Central Africa Bushmeat Crisis Group. You'll see in this photo a protected species pangolin that is, was prepared as food. And so this group was really um, looking at what is being consumed? What are those preferences? How can local organizations work with helping communities better understand the protected species, the impact of consuming them, and also some of the risks? Next slide. And out of this Central Africa Bushmeat Crisis Group, one of our other projects, which was a, a partnership with the Zoological Society of London and US Fish and Wildlife Service is our mentor program. This really looks at developing a transdisciplinary team of conservation professionals to address the bushmeat trade and apply actions there. So not only biologists, but also lawyers, people working in policy, and again, working at the local level in Central Africa. Um, we have, um, Francis Tala on our call today, and he'll be joining us next month as well, who really led this group and continues to lead the, um, the professional conservationists and those working on these areas um, in Central Africa. And then finally, I'll mention briefly in the next slide, um, C4 is going to be following us, um, but one of our projects with C4 is creating an evidence base for developing and evaluating interventions to reduce unsustainable bushmeat hunting in Central Africa. This is really bringing together a platform where the information that is available is in one place for a variety of users and can really help to bring that data together and tell people to um, understand what is some of the evidence out there in terms of information. All right, um, next slide. Um, and just um, kind of echoing some of the things that Natalie had um, mentioned in terms of evidence, some of the big questions that we have we still are looking at what's the scale of wild meat use, like how, how many tons of bushmeat is coming into urban areas? What are the protected species that are sold? Do we know in terms of consumers, what's being, what are the species that are consumed legally versus illegally? And if we do need to make changes, what motivates consumers? What are their preferences? And then in terms of data in relation to our learning question in terms of enforcement, what are the results of enforcement measures? Are the rules that are on the books ones that are working? Um, what about enforcement officers? What kind of training is available for them in terms of not only knowing what the laws are, but also knowing how to work with communities? And then in terms of wildlife, we have some very basic questions as where is the wildlife? What's the density of wildlife? Are there enough animals to be consuming them at the rate that we're seeing in urban markets? And then also, what are those changes? Are these um, changes in wildlife, are they um, ones that are going to be sustainable? And are these wildlife populations viable? So how long can we be consuming at a particular um, level? All right, and then our last slide um, will be a teaser for our next, our future webinar. I already mentioned that um, Francis Tala will be joining us for this. And a few things that we'd like you to consider before we meet. Wherever you're working, the areas that you are, what are some of those protected species? This may change from communities to countries to international. And so you know, take a look at where you're working and what are those protected species. If there is a poster available in your area that has protected species, we challenge you to bring that to share on the next, um, the next time. And in our slide on the work in Gabon, there was a child holding the protected species poster of Gabon. So think about where, what are protected species where you're working. If you have local markets that have bushmeat, what are those wildlife species in there? Um, think about that. And also, what is the source of that bushmeat? Where are those animals coming from? Um, are they coming locally? Are they coming from another country? Are they coming from another area of the country? Are they crossing borders? Uh, and where is that source? And then also, are there wildlife species that are no longer available in your local market? So what is, 
Um, is there other species that were available five, 10 years ago that you're no longer seeing and thinking about why? And I, I think if you spend the next month um, thinking about some of these questions, you're gonna be um, really enjoy the next session and find it um, a place where you can learn and exchange questions. And then just and one of our closing thoughts as we think about these lear this learning exchange, um, from a conservation perspective and a biodiversity perspective, without wildlife and their habitats, you know, there really is no wild meat. So how do we balance those things as we move forward with our learning? All right, thank you. Thanks so much, Lisa. We're now going to turn it over to Dr. Julia Fa from the Center for International Forestry Research. Thank you very much to everyone. Um, I'm sorry, my voice is a bit um, cranky these days uh, because I'm still suffering for a bit of a cold. But um, what I want to tell you about is, first of all, you know, the, um, the focus of the work that the Center for International Forest Research is doing, particularly in, um, in wild meat, of course, or bushmeat, as you want to call it. Um, my background is uh, slightly different perhaps from others in the sense I come from a, an academic background. I'm now a professor of biodiversity of human development in Manchester and I carry on as senior uh, visiting, um, a senior associate, a research associate at the Centre for International Forestry Research. Um, my research is uh, quite wide in many ways. I've, I've worked on issues to do with biology, economics, anthropology, human development, primarily in Africa, but also in South America. I spent quite a number of years sort of working in Mexico, and I also have a background in conservation research and projects because I worked as a conservation uh, program office uh, of the Darrell Wildlife, um, um, Wildlife Conservation Trust. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, we, we have in, um, in C4 um, a wide group of uh, individuals who have worked on issues to do with forests and people. And in particular, we have a very solid group of of women, in fact, and um, led by Robert Nassi in the past, that uh, focuses on issues to do with wild meat. Um, and certainly our approach is very much an evidence-based one. We have a research um, agenda, which is very strong, but the idea is to actually use the information that we collect to manage and govern wild meat resources in different parts of the world, primarily tropical areas and subtropical areas. What we do want to do alongside other partners of ours is to reduce the urban demand for wild meat because our evidence actually tells us up to a point that most of the um, resources that are being taken out of forests are actually ending up on the tables of people that don't really need that level of of support from wild uh, resources. Sustainable management of wildlife uh, through community management and governance is incredibly important for us. It's um, very much a million dollar question if you want a $5 million or whatever. Um, but the fact of the matter is that um, attaining sustainability of hunting is the greatest challenge that we have. And it's not just um, a scientific challenge per se, it's actually a challenge that needs people on the ground to work with us, to work together to be able to attain uh, the resources that they need in order to live properly and to have the food security that we yearn for. There's been a lot of work done recently on issues to do with One Health, zoonotic disease, and we'll tell you a little bit more about that later, and certainly capacity building of local and national um, institutions and stakeholders is fundamental for us. We have a number of students who are coming from Africa who have gone to Oxford uh, to work with uh, Dr. Lauren Coward, 
and others. Um, we are very committed to actually not just train people, but actually restitute. And that's not a word in English, but certainly it's a very strong word in French. Restitution, take back the information that we have collected and work with our communities and train communities of what we are doing, inform them what we are doing. Next, uh, please. Um, um, in, in terms of strategic, uh, strategic approaches, we're actually targeting behavior to change uh, um, how people feel or whether they want to eat meat and wild meat in, in urban situations, improve and harmonize a legal and policy framework. We do a lot of that in conjunction with the Sustainable Wildlife Program, which we'll hear about now, and of course, regulate sustainable subsistence hunting. Again, a problem, not just in terms of science, but also in terms of working with people to achieve that. Next, please. Um, our key projects, um, we, and we have a number of projects uh, in which we're involved in. We've um, C4 through its uh, Bushmeat uh, Research Initiative has been active in many, many countries. There's about 16 different countries that we worked in with a lot of support from USAID. We've had a fantastic relationship with USAID through Diane Russell and now the new uh, um, the new um, group of people that are there. Certainly one of our major projects now is the European Union S Sustainable Wildlife Management Project or program. This is a very large program. It's being funded by the ACP, the African, Caribbean and Pacific groups of countries that are linked to the European Union. We have had already five years of work they're in different parts of the world, um, yeah, certainly a lot in Africa, but also in the Pacific, in Papua New Guinea, and in Guyana, um, as part of the Caribbean sector of that. We're now going into phase two, uh, which is um, going to be very exciting because there are new programs, new project areas coming into the program that will um, enhance what we have been doing for the last five years. Next one, please. Um, um, the um, a very significant project within C4 is has been um, has been mentioned before is the wild meat project. This is I, I it's definitely the first and the most. Um, the largest database compilation of information on wild meat, primarily now from Africa, but certainly we are now bringing in information from Latin America and other parts of the world. It's a, it's a joint uh, project with many different members coming in. We're very grateful to the support from US uh, Fish and Wildlife, USAID and others. And uh, if we can have the next uh, slide, please. There's a, a, an accumulation of information where literally hundreds of people and hundreds of organizations have gathered data over time. And together, I think we can put all that together and come up with uh, a vision, a better vision of what's happening in different parts of the world in relation to exploitation of wild meat. I think the success of this, and next one, please, can be seen from the information that's already been published, that is being uh, collected and collected and analyzed. And I think the, the success of this um, big project is going to be seen very quickly, very soon. The next project is one that, um, that's been funded by um, uh, the GI said, sorry, I'm, I'm taking a bit too long perhaps, um, but there, um, you know, we, uh, we have been focusing on issues to do with, um, you know, how is zoonotic diseases transmitted? Um, who are the, the people most exposed to diseases, not just uh, viruses, but actually foodborne diseases, which are primarily the ones that affect people on the ground. Next one, please. Another interesting and uh, very successful key project 
is a Yangambi uh, area landscape that has different components of what uh, we have been doing in the past, you know, working with communities, understanding the status of wildlife, and generally sort of coming together to come up with uh, new, uh, new ways of protecting wildlife and ensuring that people have uh, sustainable wildlife resources for them to use. Next one, please. I mean, in terms of data, there's uh, data coming from different areas. Um, you know, certainly the Wyoming database has already been used to estimate offtake, to analyze different types of meat interventions, to compile a list of available wild meat ecological methods and indicators. And this year, we aim to further analyze the database and increase the scope of what that we're doing. Thank you, Julia. Much. I'm afraid we're going to have to <clears throat> give you the hook at this yes, point. Yes, I know. <laughs> I, I'm I'm very sorry. It's like my voice. I can't really go faster than what I've done. But thank you very much for your tolerance. Um, thank you. Really appreciate it. Particularly fighting through uh, some some yes. voice yes. And, and throat issues. Um, so stay tuned for um, C4's webinar in June, where you'll hear a lot more about the Sustainable Wildlife Management Project. Uh, thank you so much. So now we're going to move into our breakout groups. And um, I'm actually going to turn this over to Katie to explain how this is going to work. But you'll have the opportunity to choose which of three groups you're going to go to for a more targeted conversation. Yes, so now we're back to recording, just FYI. Your breakout groups were not recorded, this part is. Uh, but thank you all very much for your inputs, for your thoughts, for your questions, for your challenges. Um, these are things that we're we want to build community so that we can continue to learn from each other. Um, so you will see these Padlets again. You still have access to them. So if you have additional thoughts that you'd like to add, you can still do that, and we greatly appreciate it. Um, right now, we're going to do a very, very quick evaluation. So again, you'll see um, the poll questions popping up for you, and we want to know. Did we, did we clearly share the objectives of today's learning exchange? Um, we wanna know how applicable you expect this series to be for your work. And um, we'd like to have just a quick indication of which of the webinars you plan to participate in or, or listen to afterwards. All of these are gonna be recorded. Um, so we want this to be a, a resource for you. And then if you've got any advice or feedback for us on how to make um, the next sessions better than this one or you know any any challenges that we should know about, please let us know there. Um, and then on the while you do that, um, on the next slide, I just wanted to tee up again the webinars that are yet to come. So the next one, US Fish and Wildlife Service is going to lead uh, the webinar on wild meat enforcement and governance. That's on May 24th. And then on June 21st, C4 and colleagues are going to lead a, um, a webinar on the Sustainable Wildlife Management Project. And then in July, um, I and USAID colleagues are going to lead a session on Wild Meat and One Health, where we're bringing together these various aspects, um, really trying to bring our full theory of change together. And then again, we'll be really digging in on how do all of these strategic approaches come together? Which ones do we need? How many do we need? What is essential for us to be able to make a dent in this big sticky problem where it's not, it's not any one thing in isolation, it's this complicated combination of things. So we really hope that you'll be able to join us for that. And thank you again for your time and for your participation. Um, we really appreciate it. Hope everyone has a great day. Thank you so much.